I will turn it over to Mark. Okay, well, thanks, Gary, uh, for the opportunity to, to use this forum to share our work and to learn about the different uh, other DMF efforts that are underway. Uh, there's a lot of familiar faces that I've seen uh, in attendance of these talks, also some new employees. So for those of you that I haven't yet met, my name is Mark Russo and I'm DMF's Artificial Reef Project Coordinator. Um, DMS Artificial Reef Project is one of many components of the Fisheries Habitat Program. Uh, we're led by Dr. Catherine Ford, the project staff working out of both the Gloucester and the Bedford offices. Uh, the goal of our program is to protect and enhance marine fisheries resources. Uh, and we work to address our goals primarily through technical review and through fisheries habitat research. Under technical review, we review permits for coastal construction projects and provide recommendations to provide um, to avoid and minimize impacts to marine fisheries resources. Um, staff also participates on various working groups and provides technical analysis and policy input on a variety of topics, including ocean planning, offshore wind development, and mitigation. Under fisheries habitat research, the program conducts uh, state and grant funded research related to marine fisheries habitats. Um, our staff utilize their expertise in mapping, restoration and monitoring to address fisheries habitat research needs. Uh, for today's talk, I'll be focusing on our artificial reef project, um, provide you with some general background information on artificial reefs. And we'll describe uh, the, process, uh, the, the progress on ongoing efforts uh, and summarize those efforts as well. So what is an artificial reef? Historical documentation of artificial reefs used to increase fish yields dates back to 17th century Japan. The earliest recorded artificial reef in the United States is from the 1830s in South Carolina, where logs were used to create submerged structures to improve fishing. Uh, a, a good general definition of an artificial reef is a man-made underwater structure typically built for the purpose of promoting marine life in areas of generally featureless bottom. Uh, artificial reefs are also a habitat conversion, so it's important through permit permitting when siting new artificial reefs to avoid and minimize impacts. Um, states utilize a variety of structures and techniques um, uh, in developing their own artificial reefs uh, in their own areas. Uh, something that we're not gonna really be discussing in this particular talk um, are things that are not artificial reefs. So shipwrecks, groins, jetties, breakwaters, or other engineered emergent structures designed primarily um, for shoreline protection and also opportunities for ocean dumping. Uh, there have been a few artificial reefs uh, along the Atlantic coast in the past that have failed and it's important that we learn from those mistakes and not repeat them. So there's a few images here of a tire reef that was um, deployed off of Fort Lauderdale in the early 80s of a million tires. We're avoiding this. Artificial reefs can be found throughout the United States. Uh, on the Northeast Ocean Data Portal, they've compiled and mapped the locations of over 8,500 artificial reef structures in the US using data going back to 1943. And structures have been deployed on both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans and can be found as far east as Puerto Rico and as far west as Hawaii. The reef hotspot is the Gulf of Mexico, where there are more than 5,000 map structures located between Florida and Texas. Structures mapped along the Atlantic coast include over 3,500 map structures within 337 permitted artificial reef sites from Key West to Boston Harbor. The South Atlantic region, including the states of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina, contain more than 75% of all permitted artificial reef structures on the Atlantic coast. Okay. Narrowing it further, our regionally artificial reef program development was addressed in a report released by ASMFC in 1988. The report um, titled The Profile of Artificial Reef Development was compiled in response to the 1985 release of NOAA's National Artificial Reef Plan, which provided a framework for development of more detailed site-specific artificial reef plans at the regional, state, and local levels. The 1988 report identified 58 permitted artificial reef sites located 
within the 10 state mid-Atlantic and New England region from Virginia to Maine. At that time, only New Jersey had an existing artificial reef plan while plans were in development in the states of Virginia, uh, Virginia and Maryland. As of 2020, seven of 10 states now have artificial reef plans and the state of Connecticut uh, through Connecticut Audubon and Sacred Heart University received NIFWIF funding to deploy reef balls at Stratford Point to slow erosion along a restored salt marsh. And that's considered to be the first uh, artificial reef in the state of Connecticut. So the total number of uh, permitted reef sites increased in 2020 to 143, which averages to about two to three new permitted artificial reef sites annually in the region. So for the rest of my presentation, I'll be focusing on Massachusetts. Um, in Massachusetts, building artificial reefs is consistent with the mission of the Department of Fish and Game and the Division of Marine Fisheries to conserve and enhance the Commonwealth's natural resources and to provide outdoor recre recreational opportunities to the public. And Massachusetts is at the northern extent of the network of reefs along the Atlantic coast. Uh, this is primarily due to the existence of natural hard bottom habitat along most of the coast between Plymouth and Salisbury. In black here. However, there are several structure limited focus areas uh, where new in Massachusetts where new artificialities could have some, uh, some utility and we'll discuss more of that later. Currently, there are five Mass uh, Massachusetts artificial reefs. There are two mitigation reefs, Sculpin Ledge and the Hub Line in Boston Harbor. There's a, a reef ball reef site uh, in Dartmouth that was deployed in the 1990s. And there are two reef sites in Nantucket Sound Harwich and Yarmouth. Now these two sites uh, remain open with available space for adif additional material deployments. Uh, and when I say open, I mean their permits are still ongoing. Um, the program has no dedicated funding and relies on collaborative efforts and small amounts of outside funding to conduct reef work. Uh, so the key, the key phrase there that you'll be hearing a lot for the rest of this talk, uh, this talk is collaborative efforts. So what does opportunistic means in terms of program management with very little funding? Uh, it involves the efficient use of resources to address program bottlenecks. Um, a bottleneck is a stage in the workflow that inhibits the final outcome. For mass artificial reef program, there are three different bottlenecks, which include uh, materials, siting, and permitting, and deployments. So collaborations have been utilized to address all of these bottlenecks. Uh, once the reef is created, further collaborative efforts are needed to address the monitoring and research. So the next portion of this presentation will provide more detail on ongoing efforts to acquire materials, to site and permit new sites, material deployments, and current monitoring and research efforts of the Massachusetts Artificial Reef Program. So first, we're going to take a look at acquiring materials. Uh, the slide, the image on this slide is a uh, barge of materials that was loaded and staged in New Bedford Harbor a few days before being deployed to the Harwich Reef in 2016. Suitable material for reefing is determined by permit specifications and is in accordance with a VMF produced materials guidance document. Uh, criteria for material selection is outlined uh, in the document as well as the permit specifications. Uh, the guidelines stipulate that materials can be no longer than six feet in any dimension and no less than one square foot in area. Um, and there are other guidelines too, like no paints um, and some other, some other things that address uh, potential contaminants. Two of the most recent developments in, in, uh, in and material acquisitions revolve around uh, the Harwich deployment in 2016 and the Yarmouth deployment in 2020. Um, and they were both the results of local collaborations to secure materials. For the Harwich Reef, the Harwich Department of Conservation set, set aside suitable materials from a high school demolition and stockpiled it at the Harwich transfer station until deployment funding could be secured. For the Yarmouth site, the Cape Cod Salties and the Yarmouth uh, Department of Natural Resources secured grant, uh, granite and old uh, from an old drive-in movie theater uh, site on Route 128. To date, um, 
over 5,000 cubic yards of granite and recycled concrete from these two projects was deployed into Nantucket Sound. Um, almost all the material and storage secured by the project partners was at no cost to DMF. The primary lesson learned with respect to material acquisitions for these projects is that there's no suitable port side infrastructure on Cape Cod for loading materials onto barges. So this necessitated transporting the materials overland uh, to New Bedford in the case of the Harwich Reef and to Fall River in the case of the Yarmouth Reef, which significantly increased the deployment costs. Uh, currently, there are two other ongoing efforts to address material bottlenecks. Uh, the first was to secure a one acre parcel through a lease agreement with the Mass Clean Energy Center at the New Bedford uh, Marine Commerce Terminal for stockpiling materials for future deployments. Uh, concurrently, through a collaborative um, set up with the help of uh, Commissioner Anna Amadon and Director Pierce, an MOU between DMF and the MBTA to obtain surplus granite blocks that were removed and all culverts and bridges along the South Coast Railway Improvement Project were replaced with new infrastructure. Um, by February 2020, over 2,000 cubic yards of granite and an additional three to 400 cubic yards of repurposed concrete was collected at the site uh, and filled the entire parcel. Uh, so the material remains at the site pending uh, future funding for deployment. The second effort involves a collaboration between DMF and the United States Coast Guard involving several US Coast Guard stations responsible for maintaining navigational age. Uh, the most recent uh, collaboration involved uh, US Coast Guard Sandy Hook and US Coast Guard Woods Hole. These efforts uh, involved deploying expired navigational mooring blocks to the Yarmouth Reef site. Um, from, from that effort, um, the deployments and the deliveries were free. Uh, there were two deployments, uh, one in 2019 and one in 2020, contributing over 1,400 tons of materials to the site. Uh, additional material is expected uh, in the future and, and additional collaborative efforts with other Coast Guard facilities is also expected. Uh, to summarize material acquisition lessons learned, um, no cost materials have not really been a significant limiting factor in recent reef deployments and staging materials in a port location like New Bedford will likely help further reduce deployment costs by eliminating the handling and transportation costs experienced during the most recent deployments in Harwich and in Yarmouth. I have a question just on the uh, growth data with those uh, scale ages. So next we're gonna discuss siting and permitting. Uh, the image on this slide is a GIS map that was used to inform the initial stages of site selection um, for new sites. The areas in red on this map indicate exclusions from consideration for reefing well, due to existing uses, things like pipelines, so cables, navigation cable channels, and anchorage areas, and other things, um, or other or areas also of unsuitable habitat or existing hard bottom, which uh, uh, displays fairly prominently off Boston Harbor uh, and North Shore. Um, siting and permitting new reefs takes a considerable amount of effort and is not without its challenges. Um, Buzzards Bay, Nantucket Sound, and Cape Cod Bay have all been identified through sediment mapping as containing large areas of sand or soft sediments with limited natural structure. Uh, Buzzards Bay and Nantucket Sound both contain reefs, uh, and there's been uh, expressed interest in expanding reefs into Cape Cod Bay by the Cape Cod Salties, uh, the Cape Cod Commercial Charter Boats Association, uh, and the REC panel. So all recent efforts uh, to site new reefs has been focused on lower Cape Cod Bay. Uh, data collection for selecting possible sites uh, occurred in 2018, and we're currently writing up an EIR for permitting. The blue squares that you see in this figure, um, they're 15 acre reef sites uh, located in Sandwich, Dennis, and Brewster that were selected as sites to move forward uh, for permitting. This is a little bit of a busy slide, so um, I'll make sure I try and cover everything that I want to say here. 
Um, so we side scan surveyed about 12,000 acres within these red boxes uh, in 2018. And analyzing that side scan survey data, we identified 66 uh, survey cells, 250 meter square survey cells for further ground truthing. Um, ground truthing was a multi-tiered uh, effort, it included collecting photo imagery of the sediment at all the sites and additional diver surveys of a smaller subset of the survey cells to provide information to winnow down preferred sites to areas identified uh, in the previous slide. Uh, Pre-application pre permitting talks uh, for four sites began with MEPA last June. Um, many of you probably uh, also participated in Tracy Pugh's talk in this red line here represents what I'm gonna call Tracy Pugh's blob. And that is um, a, 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 an outline of the blob um, with respect to the dissolved oxygen incident that occurred in Cape Cod Bay over the last two summers. And this has caused us to shift our efforts to focus primarily looking at the, the two sites um, to the east in Brewster and Dennis. So th there, are, there are going to be other significant challenges to siting and permitting artificial reefs in Cape Cod Bay. Um, it's going to require all levels of permit from um, the local Wetlands Protection Act all the way through the Army Corps permit, including state permits. It's right whale critical habitat. So we're going to have to um, do a thorough assessment uh, to address that. There's some commercial surf clam trawling activity in the area. And then we have uh, the, 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 new, uh, the new dissolved oxygen blob that we also have to address. Uh, so some other siting and permitting challenges. Uh, in 2016, DMF received a Hurricane Sandy Coastal Resilient Grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to design a plan to reuse dredge rock to protect Boston Harbor shoreline. This project utilized our experiences with artificial reefs to identify sites to help to design structures to maximize potential benefits to fisheries. This was a design project that did not result in any deployments. However, there were several key findings from this project. Um, one is the utility of the reefs to provide shoreline protection without impeding sediment transport along uh, the shoreline. Uh, we, we looked at um, Gallops Island. Um, we contracted out uh, Applied Coastal to do some hydrodynamic modeling. And some of the results of that work uh, determined that in order for us to achieve any uh, shoreline protection value in this area that structures would need to be emergent. Um, also the timeline for the permitting of the potential sites did not align with the uh, the dredge project so we were not able to um, secure permits uh, before they were finished with the project. Uh, there was a regulatory subcommittee that recommended permitting the reef building separately uh, from the navigational dredge project. Um, so this could be a to be continued project, um, but that remains to be seen. Uh, the site would require uh, funding resources beyond those available um, through the beneficial reuse of the dredged material. Next, we're gonna talk about deployments. Uh, deployments represent the culmination of all the siting and the permitting, permitting work. Uh, in the cases of uh, the Harwich and the Yarmouth Reef, the contractors were for deployments were hired through an RFR. Um, time management around the weather and the contractor schedules were the key factors in the deployment planning. There are three distinct deployment, uh, deployments over the last five years, totaling over uh, 5,000 cubic yards of materials with uh, deployment costs totaling just under $400,000. Approximately four acres of habitat has been enhanced. Um, there are some short videos of the reef deployments that you can, uh, you can watch on the Mass Marine Fisheries YouTube channel. But these were all collaborative efforts um, in, in, Har in Harwich. We coordinated with the town of Harwich uh, and some charter boat captains. Um, like I mentioned earlier, there were several collaborations with uh, different U.S. Coast Guard facilities um, and then Yarmouth Reef site, um, Cape Cod Salties, as well as the town. So for monitoring, monitoring consists of compliance monitoring and performance monitoring. Um, 
as well as some ground truthing for site selection. Over the last several years, 10 to $15,000 from the Marine Recreational Fisheries Development Fund, the saltwater permit fees has been utilized for monitoring and every site is uh, visited at least once per year. Compliance monitoring is uh, conducted to assess placement and stability of reef materials in accordance with the conditions specified in a permit. Uh, the most recent compliance monitoring addressed material placement at the Yarmouth site. So this image on the left is a pre-deployment side scan sonar survey. And the image on the right is the post-deployment uh, side scan survey. This is the areas of the old tire deployments, um, high density tire areas. Uh, the proposed area for the, uh, the most recent deployment funded through ILF is here. The actual deployment is this purple box and then the Coast Guard deployment is this area within this blue circle. Um, just to get a little bit more detailed into this, uh, you'll notice there's a, um, uh, a defined slope edge here that, that um, comes out in the side scan sonar survey data. And that was, that was a, a, a very useful feature to help us line up our track lines when we were assessing height off the bottom using the bottom profiles from the side scan sonar sur uh, survey imagery. These are the two tracks, the pre and post tracks here. This is this is that, um, that slope edge that you can see. And then this is the reefs, the purple and the green um, points here are the, the, uh, the result of the reef deployment, the post-deployment survey. For performance monitoring, different monitoring methods can yield different results. Uh, and there are sampling biases with all the methods. So uh, it's important for us when we're trying to collect data at artificial reefs that we consider them all. And this is a graphic um, of species presence on the Harwich Reef between 2016 and 2018. Uh, several tools were added to our toolbox, post-deployment GoPros and acoustic receivers uh, that aided in the collection of um, species of interest data at this site. We also use uh, acoustic receiver data. This is a, a, a graphic from the first two years of the Harwich Reef. Uh, we give our acoustic receiver data, uh, which we collect on all our sites to uh, Greg and Bill for their acoustic work. Uh, it's their data, they tag the fish. Uh, but uh, for the purposes of this particular graphic, um, none of these fish were tagged on the site. There are at least three different species. Two of the fish were picked up in both 2016 and 2018. Most fish were passing through, but a few fish did stay on or nearby the reef for several days. The first detection was in mid-May and the last detection was in mid-October. There were no detections in September. Um, so it was very interesting data and usually it generates more questions than it answers. Like, you know, why is it we really, witness striped bass on the reef in our videos or our uh, diver surveys. And clearly there's um, um, a presence. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about BRUV. This is another tool that we've incorporated into our performance monitoring toolbox. Uh, BRUV is baited remote underwater video and as part of the pre-deployment work for the ILF funded Yarmouth Reef, um, we conducted a study using grubs in 2018 with the help of volunteers from the Cape Cod Salties and uh, Northeastern University Three Seas intern. Here are our sites, there's four sites. There's the Harwich Reef, a bear control site immediately um, in between the Harwich Reef and the Yarmouth Reef. Here's the Tire Reef and here's a natural site uh, next to Bishop and Clerks in Nantucket Sound. Um, some of the results of the Bro study finding, um, the average time in seconds to finfish arrival at the bear site versus sites with structure here, um, the average species richness across all the sites uh, and the Shannon Wiener diversity in index across all the sites here, basically indicating that uh, diversity is fairly uniform throughout Nantucket Sound at all our sites. Um, some more specific data in, uh, in, in this figure here, which is figure six, is uh, estimating the marginal mean abundances of juvenile undersized and fishable black sea bass across the natural reef sites, artificial reef sites, and the bear control sites. Um, the patterns are very interesting here. This is for SCUP, uh, and this, this 
Uh, this indicates that um, with age, we tend to, of the structure, we tend to see larger fish. And we're not sure if there's any um, extractive influences on this data. That's a topic for uh, another day. Uh, but this data is, is going to inform um, how we monitor reefs in terms of uh, their progression um, towards um, uh, representing uh, what, a, what a natural reef looks like in that environment. There's some more information on our broad study um, in a, a publication uh, from uh, Estuaries and Coast that was released back in May. Uh, the BRUV work will continue as a component of the performance monitoring for the ILF project for at least the next five years. Um, there are other BRUV studies that we currently have in the pipeline uh, that would be great intern opportunities, um, including looking at changes in species abundance as you move away from the reef site. Now, we also do ground truthing, which is uh, directed short-term efforts uh, for selecting sites. Our recent ground truthing efforts uh, focused on Lower Cape Cod Bay for the work we're doing now for permitting, as well as uh, in Gallops Island for the, uh, the NIFWF grant. Uh, another key component that I did not, uh, didn't really fit well into this particular um, talk structure, but is definitely worth mentioning is um, a new regulation was implemented after the Harwich Reef was installed in 2016. CMR 322 section 809 restricts commercial fishing activity and setting of traps on the reef or within a 200 foot buffer around the reef, which makes Harwich Reef uh, strictly for recreational use. Um, this sets a potential precedent for regulating reef use at future sites, but it would be at our discretion and handled on a case by case basis. So uh, in summary, I just wanna say that um, uh, collaboration and community support for all the, to address all the different bottlenecks in our program is essential. Um, we, we can't do it without working with other people. Material availability has really not been a problem or a limiting factor for any of the most recent deployments. Uh, the siting and the permitting is the most difficult, difficult bottleneck uh, and it, informed decision-making is gonna be critical in going through that process. Um, deployments can occur at any time of the year. The last two deployments occurred uh, in the middle of winter. Um, and that's, that's an important uh, factor to consider when identifying potential time of year restrictions or work windows for future sites uh, in different areas. Um, and for monitoring, we're always developing new ways to try and get uh, answers to some of our specific questions. Um, and with that, um, I will say thank you to everybody and I will take questions. I left the acknowledgement section off uh, to the end because I was going through some material this morning uh, on our W drive to try and identify everybody that's helped with this project in the past. And there's a lot of people. You know, just in this image, there's, I think, 25 people. It's what I enjoy most about the project. It's a great example of a collaborative effort amongst DMS staff. So I wanted to thank you all. And I also wanted to mention a few people that I don't have pictures for that I know have also contributed to our efforts uh, among them uh, out of Boston, Jared Silva, Shannon Davis, and Doug Cameron out of the New Bedford office, Mark Szymanski, Jim Manfredi, Derek Perry, Mike Trainer, Tracy Pugh, Terry O'Neill, Greg Scomo, uh, the Gloucester, Bill Hoffman, Nicole Ward, Joel Betch. Those are some of the names that come to mind when I think about people that have helped work on our reef projects recently. I'm sure I forgot some people, so I apologize if I missed you. Um, but um, once again, thank you. And uh, with that, I'll take questions. <laughs>